for joining us here tonight. Um, when I was preparing for this evening, speaking to Elaine Graham and Anna Bosman, I noticed that something special uh, promised to be happening here tonight. Because two people would rather, would uh, rarely have more oppositional views on the same topic, that is hope. Um, is hope an answer uh, to counter the politics of fear that seem to govern our Western societies? Or is it rather just a lazy way to deal with our insecurity? Um, Elaine Graham, our main speaker, teaches at the University of Chester in the United Kingdom. Um, she is one of the leading public theologians in Europe, and she used to be the chairperson of the Global Network for Public Theology. And as a practical theologian, she is mainly interested in the question if religious commitment can really make a difference in today's world. Um, she was invited by the Department of Systematic Theology, and in particular, Professor Christoph Hübenthal. After her lecture, she will discuss the topic of hope with Professor Anna Bosman. Um, Anna Bosman teaches dynamics of learning and development at the Faculty of Social Sciences. Um, her research, which mainly focuses on special education, combines a strong scientific approach with relevant practical, societal and philosophical issues. And this, the discussion will be chaired by philosopher Maite Cholahi, and of course there will be plenty of room for your own questions. My name is Lisbeth Janssen, I'm a member of staff at the Sutebeek program, and I wish you all a very pleasant, but above all, inspiring evening. Thank you. Thank you, Lisbeth, and thank you for this invitation to speak this evening. It's a great privilege to be here. In his book, Culture of Fear, Risk-Taking and the Morality of Low Expectation, the sociologist Frank Furedi offers a sobering analysis of contemporary Western culture. The defining feature, he says, is the belief that humanity is confronted by powerful destructive forces that threaten our everyday existence. The line that used to delineate reality from science fiction has become blurred. So government officials have looked into the alleged threat posed by killer asteroids to human survival. Some scientists warn that an influenza pandemic is around the corner. Others claim that time is running out for the human race unless we do something about global warming. The end is nigh is no longer a warning issued by religious fanatics. Rather, scaremongering is represented as the act of a concerned and responsible citizen. He continues, politics has internalized the culture of fear. The fear of terror, the fear of food, the fear of asylum seekers, the fear of antisocial behavior, fears over children, fear about health, fear for the environment, fear for our pensions, fears over the future of Europe. The politics of fear transcends the political divide. This all-pervading climate of fear rests on a deeper sensibility, perhaps based on an overwhelming inability to control our environment, an awareness of the limitations of technocratic solutions, the illusions of unlimited growth, the failings of government, of the very existential vulnerability of humanity in the face of the unknown. Puredi concludes, Perhaps the distinct feature of our time is not the cultivation of fear, but the cultivation of vulnerability. When most forms of human experience come with a health warning, we are continually reminded that we cannot be expected to manage everyday risks. And if vulnerability is the defining feature of the human condition, we are quite entitled to fear everything. We might date this contemporary cultural mood initially from the attacks of 9-11, when public safety and security became an abiding preoccupation of governments around the world and gave rise, of course, to the notorious war on terror. Then, the global economic crisis of 2008 initiated a protracted period of recession 
and public cynicism towards the corruption and amoralism of financial institutions and the indifference of democratically elected governments, as expressed in the Occupy movement, the indignatos or protests in Greece, Turkey and Brazil. In Western Europe, it's there in the turn to right-wing political parties, such as the United Kingdom Independence Party in Britain, which is currently riding a wave of populist support for its rough and ready antagonism to the European Union, immigration and liberal welfare policies. But the politics of fear is also there in the responses of the state itself. Security policies implemented from the top down, which depend on our complicity with the discourses of fear, control and self-protection for their justification, be that the fear of young Muslims radicalised by Facebook, the spread of global pandemics such as Ebola, the threat of immigrants to established cultures and to economic security. The fearful citizen turns to the powers of the state for comfort and stability, trading off universal surveillance against the threat of antisocial behaviour. At times of economic recession, fear and uncertainty are predominant emotions. In Europe, the younger generation cannot hope to enjoy the levels of job security, welfare assistance, or material well-being of their parents' generation. And the well-being of children and young people is particularly relevant here. In a series of reports commissioned for the Children's Society in the UK between 2009 and 2014, Researchers have highlighted the myriad problems facing young people today, not least the dangers of drug and substance abuse, and bullying, especially through social media, and low self-esteem. The Good Childhood Report of 2014 reveals that out of 39 countries surveyed for their subjective well-being, um, Wales was ranked as 26th, Scotland 31st, and England 32nd, that's out of 39. Uh, the Netherlands, you may be pleased to know, is ranked second after Macedonia, and just ahead of Armenia, Greenland, and Iceland. So I wonder what might account for the different results. Subjective well-being in this case is defined as a person's own evaluation of how they feel about their lives, and there's a whole literature about how that is measured. But once again, at least for children in the UK, the picture is bleak. As the report says, our research highlights stubborn and persistent issues of bullying, insecurity and anxiety. Children growing up with little hope for the future. With little hope for the future. So what is to be done? Such new political developments, including economic recession, climate change, globalisation, the threat of pandemics, declining levels of subjective well-being, cultural pluralism and religious conflict have, I believe, created the urgent need for a new conception of politics itself, one capable of re-injecting the public imagination with fresh approaches to our global problems. It will need to overcome our fears through concrete and tangible means. It will need to nurture our sense of discernment over our common priorities and our discussions of right and wrong. And it will need to utilise and harness our imaginations in pursuit of new and innovative resolutions to our problems. But how do we move from the politics of fear to the politics and practices of hope? How is hope nurtured, both in individuals and at societal level? Some would say that related to the collapse of hope, and any meaningful political vision is the question of secularisation and the gradual retreat of organised religion into the margins of public life. Contemporary society is such that we cannot simply look to conventional organised religion to provide us, however, with a renewed set of ready-made personal or social values. People's spiritual lives are far more eclectic, far more personalised, far more heterodox. But nevertheless, can we learn some lessons from religion and maybe harness some of its social capital and its imagination to begin to articulate new sources of meaning and vision? Well, do we even need religion? 
for constructive social values? And is it even capable in today's society of providing them? For the German philosopher Jürgen Habermas, the global financial crisis of 2008 exposed not only material and structural inequalities in the capitalist system, but also a lack of inherent values and visions in its operations. Essentially, he says, the logic of the market has hollowed out any normative considerations of social justice and rendered all the more urgent the rejuvenation of a democratic political economy and a rigorous culture of public deliberation. Secular modernity, he argues, appears to have lost its grip on the images preserved by religion of the moral whole of the kingdom of God on earth as collectively binding ideals. In conversation with members of the Jesuit School of Philosophy in Munich in 2007, Habermas alluded to a kind of melancholy in late modernity, a sense of lack within secular communicative reason, as he says, an awareness of what is missing, namely any sort of metaphysical grounding of a commitment to things such as justice, progress, and human dignity. Pragmatism alone, he argues, is incapable of sustaining a global vision of human dignity and moving secular materialist citizens to an awareness of the violations of solidarity throughout the world, of what cries out to heaven. Habermas has therefore called for a re-evaluation of the secular nature of the public square and the reintroduction of religious sources of reasoning, albeit mediated by processes of translation into common terms, as an enrichment of our social and political imaginary, a means of incorporating those missing values into a renewed vocabulary of civic virtue. But is there any substance to this expectation? Can our public life really be rejuvenated by the reintroduction of religious values and discourses? The signs do not appear to be hopeful. Certainly, there are signs of vitality, such as the growth of religious pluralism. Religion is also returning to public prominence as a significant factor in global politics and civil society. It's newly <coughs> prominent once more, even in countries which had long considered themselves to be secular, particularly uh, around its potentially beneficial contribution to welfare reform, well-being and community cohesion. But this revival, this new visibility, is nevertheless still occurring within a framework of strong resistance to religion as a form of public reason within the academy and political culture more broadly. Even where faith is proving resilient, however, its growth areas are often de-institutionalised and heterodox, such as in the growing phenomenon of those who self-identify as spiritual but not religious. Even though religion may be newly visible then, I'm convinced that the language of revival or even of de-secularisation is inappropriate. As I've said elsewhere, we are experiencing simultaneous religious decline, mutation and resurgence. Decline, mutation and resurgence. This is then the state of the post-secular, the post-secular, defying the simple logic either of secular rationalism or of religious revival. Whatever is happening to our religious life cannot be set up as a simple return to what went before. The Rubicon of secularism has, if you like, been crossed, and the conditions of belief have radically shifted. In Charles Taylor's words, from a society in which it was virtually impossible not to believe in God, to one in which faith even for the staunchest believer, is one human possibility among others. That argument that secular and religious versions of social transformation are incompatible is well rehearsed, of course, as is the more popular view that faith and politics <laughs> don't mix. After all, the ethos of modernity was one of human emancipation from the straitjacket of tradition, superstition and author authoritarianism so often represented by institutional religion. For many secular liberals, religious values cannot possibly nurture public discourses of progress and human development. And yet, the reality is, on the ground, 
that religious narratives often inform not only narratives of personal salvation, but social and structural transformation as well. This is not a question of calling for everyone to return to faith in God, but it is a suggestion that we can build a new politics of hope forged from some of these fragments, which are present strongly, but not exclusively, in religious traditions. And I think those values embody some of the following qualities. An ability to inhabit and articulate a clear worldview, which enables us to chart a steady course through the hardships of life. A model of selfhood that is premised on an ability to affirm and be affirmed by significant others in a mutuality of becoming, with a robust sense of the integrity of the other and a mutuality of relationships. Also cultivation of the imagination and qualities of play, wonder and self-transcendence. I want to argue that religion is not exclusively uh, uh, present in cultivating these kinds of qualities, but it does actually represent a very powerful collective and communal expression of these kinds of values. And it is one place where these qualities of hope and resilience can be cultivated for the common good. Let's return then to some of that research on children's subjective well-being. It's notable that the various literatures on happiness and well-being are increasingly focusing on the importance of values and beliefs in shaping levels of satisfaction or quality of life. A key voice in this important debate is the economist Richard Layard, who identified research that shows that religious belief is one of seven key factors which affect the well-being of the nation, including children and young people. What the literature on well-being acknowledges time after time is the significance for people of what Richard Layard terms a strong philosophy of life. This is certainly not identical with organised religion, although Layard at several points does indeed declare that people who believe in God are happier. And certainly some kind of correlation between belief and well-being does seem to be evident. For example, the Centre for Spirituality, Theology and Health at Duke University in the United States publishes digests of research in this area and reports on a series of clinical studies which suggest, among other things, that rates of recovery of cancer patients may be better amongst those who report an involvement in faith communities, as well as better longevity amongst those who attend places of worship, such as synagogues, slower rates of cognitive decline in those experiencing the onset of dementia, and some marginal impact on aspects of coping strategies in relation to recovery from serious illness. People with some kind of religious affiliation do appear to have a greater capacity for resilience in the face of physical, emotional or financial insecurity. And this is significant, that in this respect well-being cannot be equated simplistically with happiness, as in the absence of conflict or adversity, but well-being and resilience in the face of life's troubles. The evidence is varied but rich although clearly such research raises important questions of method and interpretation. For example, is the incidence of better mental health amongst religious people due to divine influence or human solidarity? Do different religious traditions deliver to different degrees of well-being? What about religious traditions that stress individual practices such as meditation in comparison to more corporate ones? What's the relationship between religion and spirituality, between, on the one hand, organisational, formal dimensions of observance, as opposed to a more subtle appreciation of existential or transcendent dimensions to life that may be non-credal and non-institutional. In terms of explaining the correlation between religion and well-being, the consensus seems to be that there is some kind of added value to religion. And that appears to be down to a combination of factors, amongst which social support and membership of a faith community is preeminent, but which also extends to other forms of religious practice, such as prayer, 
reading one's sacred scriptures, a sense of meaning and existential belief system, and a well-articulated moral code. Whilst other secular activities might provide some of these elements, commentators such as Richard Eckersley argue that religion packages these components effectively and accessibly. A, re a related dimension to this is research on the significance of religion for fostering active citizenship through repositories of what is called social capital, the reserves that enable us to engage with a wider community uh, through volunteering and other forms of citizen involvement. The sociologist Robert Putnam has probably led the way in charting how religious values and organisations foster precisely the very networks and relationships that seem to contribute most decisively to healthy social networks and thus to our quality of life. As Putnam has reported, churchgoers were substantially more likely to be involved in secular organisations, to vote and participate politically in other ways, and to have deeper, informal social connections. These are secondary outcomes of belonging to a community of faith and participating in the beliefs and values that have these tangible outcomes, in terms of setting our course through life and being able to keep afloat and stay on course, despite whatever life may throw at us. Other systems of believing and belonging may have them. One thinks of secular fellowships for those recovering from addiction, for example, which speaks of a spirituality and draws on an understanding of higher power that is overtly and decidedly non-religious. But if religion is one of the more potent sources of strong values and principles that appear to make the difference as people steer their way through the world, then it may be because it represents a powerful synthesis of belief and action. It's about being able to articulate some clear and basic criteria of human flourishing and what actually constitutes a life well lived. This in turn enables us to exercise discernment about what is good for us in short and long-term perspective. In that respect, we touch on the field of virtue ethics, which is about how one cultivates the gift of moral insight. Seeking and attaining the good and our own well-being, as well as that of the planet, is not about following a fixed path, but about acquiring the map reading skills by which one navigates one's route through life. We might then ask what kinds of organisations or creeds best nurture and sustain the practical wisdom of that moral individual, and to consider whether in fact it is not something an individual can manage in isolation, but comprises something more like an ecology of virtue, in which the individual's participation in a community's shared ethos cultivates this practical wisdom of resilience and discernment. All in all then, well-being at personal and societal levels seems to come from being connected and engaged, from being supported in a web of relationships and interests. This gives structure and meaning to people's lives. And this is possibly where communities of faith score highly by having narratives, rituals and practices by which accounts of hope and obligation are continuously being worked out. But this is less about getting religion uh, as entrenchment in nostalgia or dogmatic values. I think it's more about learning what it means to live in community with one another and to take that further, of confronting our fears and taking the risk of mutuality with the other. This may be contained within the religious imagination, but it goes much more deeply into what it means to be human altogether. Once again, research into sources of children's well-being may offer clues. Here we find traces of these same elements, a sense of connection to things greater than themselves, and the cultivation of the imagination contribute to qualities of empathy, enhance resilience and self-esteem. In the original study by the Children's Society in 2009 of children's well-being, Richard Layard and Judy Dunn describe children as being a sacred trust who should be cherished and nurtured during their formative years. They affirm childhood as being a special time in which children gain a lasting sense of their own identity and self-worth. 
They argue that the child is incomplete without some kind of passionate engagement with the world around them. They further state that children should be encouraged to comprehend the spiritual quality of inner peace and an awareness of something greater than themselves. In later studies, these themes of engagement, self-transcendence and trust are reiterated. What most underpins mature subjectivity and resilience is a capacity to connect and the experience of being loved by others. In the 2014 study, interestingly, children who use the internet were slightly more likely to experience greater well-being, which may go against some of our assumptions about uh, being locked into video games and uh, up in your bedroom in isolation, but actually the internet was a source of connection. But other sources were for children uh, playing sport and spending time with friends. For the age group of 14 to 16 year olds, the report found that emotional support, physical care, educational support and supervisory monitoring all contributed to higher levels of subjective well-being. In his book, Lost Icons, published in 2000, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, offers further important insights into the kinds of values that foster the well-being of children. He highlights the necessity of not imposing the roles and expectations of adulthood onto young people too quickly. This can happen, for example, through an educational system that's under pressure to give priority to narrowly functional concerns, which treat education as a consumer good to be marketed to parents and students who are known revealingly as customers. This system values academic performance and testing above the simple activities of curiosity, imagination and play. Similarly, the market is turning children away from the traditional grounds of childhood and turning them into consumers, such that the child becomes an economic subject, subject to advertising, treated as a pseudo-adult, but lacking an adult awareness of cost and risk. The same applies, says Rowan Williams, to the sexualization of children in much media and advertising. We no longer safeguard a special place where identities can be learned and tested in imagination before fully adult commitments have to be made. But childhood needs to be a period where we can make mistakes, try things out, explore projects and different identities without having to be bound by the consequences. Hence, role plays, fantasies and playground rhymes, stories that sit light to realism or moral tidiness, the attraction of mythical, magical or alternative worlds. But this protection of the imaginative space of childhood needs a background of security, adult availability and consistency. Williams therefore draws together themes of play, imagination and interdependence or relationality as conditions for the child to grow into a healthy adult. We might say that these are things that seek, above all, to respect the childlikeness of the child. The childlikeness of the child. And childlikeness, I think, not to be confused with childishness. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, first adopted in 1989, touches on many similar areas. Of the primary necessity of meeting a child's material needs, such as right to food, shelter and health care, but also meeting the things that nurture the spirit and the imagination as well. Those things which transport us beyond immediate and tangible needs into a wider appreciation of the world at large. Education is the obvious vehicle of this, and rights to privacy, freedom of speech and belief reflect the formal declarations of human rights in general and say a lot about the universality and irreducibility of personal dignity and integrity. So there's much, again, that honours the child within the child. The right to relax and play, in Article 31. The right to meet and mix with other children, Article 15. To have their views taken seriously, Article 12. And above all, to receive the care and love of parents and others, and to receive protection, respect and dignity. I wonder then whether these elements function 
as wellsprings of personal flourishing and well-being, not just for children but for adults, and may also be benchmarks for a sustainable body politic capable of responding to the politics of fear and risk with hope and resilience. All of this begins to add up to a fascinating model of human nature, one of connectedness, self-transcendence, and interdependence. Under modernity, we've been accustomed to thinking of the ideal person as rational, autonomous, and self-actualizing. But this has been subject to increasing criticism, not least from feminist quarters, who argue that classically this understanding of the self is atomized, disconnected, and detached from vital sources such as emotion, interdependence, and relationality. The feminist philosopher Jane Flax speculates that the classic Kantian understanding of selfhood, which was highly influential for the European Enlightenment, is all about breaking with the infantile ties with the maternal in order to achieve an autonomous, reasoning, and independent self, and is therefore premised on the rejection of the feminine and of relationality and affection. Yet that model of enlightenment selfhood is being called into question by some very interesting emerging notions of the human that come to us from studies of science and technology. In particular, how we talk about what it means to be human in a technologically intensive and advanced context where we're so surrounded by technologies of communication, of surveillance, of medical intervention and enhancement, that it's no longer physically or phenomenologically appropriate to think of ourselves as anything but hybrid creatures, as evolving and interconnected within a fluid and highly networked ecology of tools, technologized nature, and informational processes. For example, Wesley Wildman's understanding of human beings as walking, thinking ecologies in the microbial world radically decenters that sovereign, rational self as a supreme island of transcendence and detachment in favour of a more embedded, contextual, and fluid anthropology. In the work of Andy Clark and David Chalmers, we're presented with a model of human subjectivity as one of extended mind. Even in the most cerebral and intellectual activities, they argue, such as doing a word puzzle or performing a memory test, often involves the use of physical aids, such as sketching on a pen and paper or rearrangement of scrabble tiles. So even the most abstract processes of internal consciousness, things we associate with the pure mind, entail an engagement with the outside world of physical material artifacts, a process Clark and Chalmers term epistemic actions. From that, they argue that the extended mind is by implication an extended self, which, as they say, outstrips the boundaries of consciousness. The philosopher Andrea Rossi brings this down to a personal level when she considers how our simplest acts of communication are premised on an assumption that we inhabit a shared world of meaning and symbol, and that our use of language is essentially a form of self-transcendence. She says this, whenever in an utterance we claim for ourselves the status of subjects, we can only make our subjectivity appear within a constellation of objects, material, conceptual, virtual, living, dead and signification, linguistic, visual, gestural, or metaphorical, that can never fully coincide with the I that we invoke. As a matter of fact, there is no way of speaking of ourselves without there being some virtual or real other. More than anything else, in order to appear, I need another I, receptive to and capable of making sense of that experience, which is implied by the use of that pronoun pronoun. Your life, your world, your sentimental and intellectual horizons might be alien or hardly comprehensible to me. They might not speak to me at all. And yet, I can still sense that they refer to something of which I have an experience too. I might misconstrue and misjudge your feelings and thoughts, but still this would not change the fact that I would recognise here, in front of me, a person who, just like me, is also capable 
and in fact is constantly compelled to recognise, narrate and give meaning to his or her own self and world. My self is tied to, it necessitates and calls for a we. Myself calls for a we. Yet by implication, this engagement between I and we, this dynamic, is accompanied by a sense of anxiety and risk. Once I reveal my true self to you, my own truth, I have to acknowledge my dependence on you, that the truth is not exclusively mine, not least because I use words and conventions of communication that were already in existence before I came into the world. There's no way of voicing the meaning of my experience without the social grammar that constituted me in the first place. But I have to run the risk of committing myself to a world of signs and codes not of my making, and to a process that rests not on the control projection of an essential self, but on a transaction, an exchange between you and me. There are theological roots to this as well. If within the Christian tradition it's believed that humanity is made in the image of God, then if we conceive of God as immutable, as transcendent and dispassionate, then our ideal model of human becoming will aspire to those same qualities. If, however, has been the case in many contemporary theologies, we ground our theological understanding in much more relational dynamics, such as conceptions of God as Trinity, and therefore premised on a divine economy of interrelationship and mutuality, or an understanding of God as revealed through Jesus and the Incarnation, and therefore existing decisively in human history, assuming and redeeming human embodiment, willingly embracing the vulnerabilities of servanthood and self-sacrifice, then these models give a very different sense of how we as humans achieve our fullest potential and purposes. So from all this, I might suggest that we are creatures whose becoming is premised on relationality and connection at a physical, cognitive and emotional level. I'd like to argue too that our development as communities and societies is also dependent on the cultivation of common purpose and mutuality rather than separation and antagonism. Easier said than done, of course, in light of the very real pressures of fear, the structural and institutional pressures, the governmental pressures. But there may be some signs of hope in forms of grassroots politics and community action that seek not to bury diversity or try to flatten out difference, but to work constructively and pragmatically with difference and diversity in pursuit of shared goals. And the shared goals, as it were, overcome the difference and draw us together in something tangible that constitutes a vision to which we direct our actions. But the point is not even that we should overcome our petty fears and block them out and simply embrace the certainty of our existence. The truth is, as I've been arguing, that these two dimensions are necessarily interlinked. The more we seek to bolster up our security in the name of peace, order and self-defence, the more we end up reproducing the conditions which created our fears in the first place. The more a state or government seeks to secure itself against a hostile international environment by building up its defence capabilities, the more it increases global insecurity as its strategy inevitably heightens the sense of threat felt by its rivals who are simply inclined to escalate their own military and security reserves in return. Instead of a politics or sensibility of fear then, we need to seek to come to terms with the risks of being human and confront them and face them, which are premised necessarily on reaching out, on connecting and self-transcending. This engenders both fear and fulfilment, but we need to learn to be comfortable with the fact that the very processes of becoming human are premised on that recognition of the other, with the concomitant risk of anxiety and the possibilities of self-transcendence. This idea correlates with that earlier view of resilience, that happiness is to be found in a struggle within a world which is governed by the dynamics of tragedy rather than comedy, of suffering in the face of moral complexity rather than in the restoration of order and stability. 
It's also present in the Aristotelian teleology, in which a life virtuously lived is constantly tested against notions of the good and the excellence, which involve ends and values that transcend our mere self-interest or subsistence. In his book, Politics of Fear, Practices of Hope, Stefan Scrimshaw argues that the pervasiveness of fear is particularly invidious in our world, insofar as it inhibits any inability to conceive of alternatives. It locks us, it freezes us in the, in the stasis of fear. By keeping us in an unending state of panic and impending crisis, the powers that be are able to maintain the status quo. In contrast to these politics of fear, he elaborates what he terms a practice of hope, and this rests on a number of features. Firstly, it distinguishes between fantasy and imagination. Hope here is not a false hope in a permanently deferred future or some kind of otherworldly piety that seeks compensation for present sufferings after our death. Rather, it deploys, it harnesses the imagination in order to conjure new creative constructions of reality for today. So the utopian imagination doesn't abstract us from the world, but makes possible the next stage of a politics of hope, which is disengagement from the inevitability of the present in order to position ourselves in an elsewhere of new possibilities. The what if, or as if, of utopia takes us beyond the already of the given towards the not yet of an anticipated future. Scrimshaw sees such utopian imagination and hope taking root in various forms of popular protest movements in the creative arts and significantly in forms of faith-based activism. All of these defy prevailing ideologies about the lack of a future hope by offering alternative visions that are rooted in the here and now, always already grounded in tangible, realizable projects, but which conjure the future out of alternative visions and imaginations. So from all this, we might construct a politics of hope that is utopian, but not otherworldly, not abstract, but grounded in the politics of relationship. It's future driven, but not futuristic. In other words, it has a realism about what is achievable, but argues that present efforts are where we begin. It calls us to get in touch with our deepest values, to feed that utopian imagination. But it also takes discernment and contemplation so that we're always self-critical about whether we're deluded for the possibilities of hope or whether the goals we set ourselves are achievable. And it's all about cultivating resilience and common purpose in the face of temporary setbacks so that we can face those and move on and take a wider vision. So one example of these local political initiatives, which allows for values-driven projects to emerge whilst respecting a diversity of religious and cultural perspectives, can be found in many of the grassroots campaigns that Scrimchar is gesturing towards, such as broad-based community action, for example, in which a range of different groups, trade unions, religious groups, neighbourhood communities, and social justice campaigns come together in common purpose. For example, in a living wage campaign, or to campaign for housing improve improvements, or facilities for children. Citizens UK is one such example. Occupy may be another. They achieve very practical and material gains. They draw together diverse groups. So they resolve that issue of everyone being in agreement across religious, secular, non-religious lines. But what they focus on are the earthed practices of hope as they take shape within grassroots contexts. And some of these local alliances across the religious, non-religious lines have led various scholars, urban geographers and theologians to talk about something called post-secular rapprochement, 
as a way of resolving this diversity within the public square. This they see as an important key to future models of civil society and political agency in a context of pluralism. It reflects this same dynamic of rooting ourselves in our own identity and learning to trust and affirm and value our own visions whilst engaging and appreciating with the otherness of the other. So grassroots activism and post-secular rapprochement represents attention to the way in which various kinds of religiously motivated activism converge with other secular agencies to form broad-based strategic alliances around initiatives of neighbourhood renewal and charitable service. And they say it addresses this post-secular dilemma of how to translate religious values into the public domain because they are translated as much through their practical efficacy as their metaphysical meaning. So again, it's all about concentrating on the here and now. That common purpose creates sufficient condition for groups of many diverse convictions to suspend their differences in the interests of pragmatic and strategic engagement towards shared goals. As a result, what each encounters in the other is the practical wisdom of a whole range of belief systems mediated through purposeful action. This kind of enacted faith in action has been characterised by one urban geographer as grounded theologies, grounded theologies, performative practices of placemaking informed by understandings of the transcendent. Performative practices of placemaking informed by understandings of the transcendent. And we might see how such grounded theologies take place in relation to human and physical environments as they help to shape particular cultural and social practices, including and especially alliances with others. It helps us to see how strategically embodied subjectivities might be religiously constituted, but also how they occur always within the ecology of specific places, points of time, or in reaction to specific sets of issues or concerns but it also to do with the formation of civic virtue, an orientation towards that broader common good, which transcends any sectional interest. Because the purpose of such alliances is not to galvanize a singular metaphysical moral vision or reinforce a singular normative worldview, but to facilitate and nourish collaborative solidarities around common moral tasks. So to conclude, we've seen evidence which suggests that our very humanity at so many levels involves connectedness and interdependence with significant others, which may include for many a defined or transcendent other. There are also strong suggestions that human flourishing and well-being are nurtured best within an ecology of relationships, of mutuality, care and trust. This depends on processes of building discernment and mutual cooperation through which we learn to value ourselves and others. These are the kinds of practices of hope by which strangers can become neighbours and a common purpose can be worked on together. They depend on the cultivation of the imagination and being able to apprehend the world in new ways, in all its wonder. And in this respect, perhaps we all need to see through the eyes of a child once more. Thank you. Well, this is a completely different um, story that I anticipated. Uh, I had no clue what you were going to talk about. Uh, I just read, fortunately, the story while you were talking. Um, and I was asked to say some, something about what I believe uh, or what I consider hope to be or what my viewpoint on hope is. And um, what I noticed in this was in your speech, in your lecture, um, that you already uh, assume that we have a mutual understanding of the word hope. But maybe we should discuss that. Um, 
And when Lisbeth asked me to, whether I was willing to dis be the discussant in this, uh, uh, in this, for this Sutabek lecture, I said, why are you asking me? I mean, I don't know anything about this issue. And uh, it was also about uh, a theological uh, lecture, and I said, I, I don't even know, even less, you know less about this, even though I was born a Catholic, and um, when I was 15, I decided that it was like to be didn't have any added value. So since then, I had never thought about it, and I thought, oh well, I have to read. I have now have to read about what hope is and what philosophers said about it. And fortunately, there was nothing to find or hardly anything. <laughs> um, there's a little, this is one story uh, by a, a Swedish guy who was talking about hope uh, in, the, uh, in the opinion of uh, uh, Richard Morty and uh, Henry Putnam. But in the end, it was all about faith and not about hope, so I thought, well, I gave up on this. Um, but you know what? I'm an, I'm an academic, I can think. So, what, if somebody asks me, what is hope? Because when I, I'm a, I'm a scientist, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a psychologist, psychologist by education, but I tend to think I'm, I'm more of a scientist in the sense of like, what is science. One of the things I've learned, which is to me very handy, is first you define the thing that you want to talk about. So, but, well, that's what I'm going to do. What's, what is hope? And I started to realize, hmm, I don't often talk about hope. And one thing I said uh, when Lisbeth asked me, I said, you know, when I use this, is when I say, when somebody says, uh, do you, uh, did so-and-so do that? And I said, oh, I, I might hope so. It's that sense, but not like, oh, I hope that this is going to happen, or I hope it's such and such is going to occur. So, but, so why is that? I thought, well, you know, in my view, hope is, in its essence, nothing. Hope is a word to me, uh, because I try to go back to bodily things, to bodily experiences. And, um, of course, I need to, to know when people use, how people use hope, it's more of a pragmatic way. And they use hope sort of to, to me to, and now we get the word, that I could find in English. Bezweren, incantate. Is that the word? Incantation? Yeah? It's like you want to try to control the future. And I call it the lazy way of doing this because, like, the, uh, the shaman, uh, he, uh, he's asked, like, listen, we need rain, we need rain. And he says, oh, let's do a rain dance. Of course, it's not going to affect. Well, not in my opinion anyway. It's not going to affect whether it's going to rain or not. But they believe that that's a good way of doing it. So they're all going to get into this dance and try to do the rain dance, and hopefully it's going to hopefully it's going to rain. <laughs> um, this is a way of coping with uncertainty. And uh, I think that what we when we do say, oh. Such a, I hope such a is not going to happen. Oh, put you there, set something wrong, put you know, It's like a besweerings formula, a, a ritual of trying to control the future that you can't control. Um, so, well, well, that's, I guess that's why it's hope for me. And as a scientist, I know I can't do this. I can't control the future. I can't even, now we know, I can't predict the future, hardly ever, uh, even though scientists try to do this, they really think they can do this, and psychologists even more strongly believe they can do it, uh, whereas physicists start to understand, meteorologists, they all start to understand, no way we're not going to do this. But it's the human nature to me, it's because we have memory, we know what happened before, we can think about it, we have some kind of way of thinking about what happened to us, so we can also think about what may occur to us. And that thing is almost sort of unlivable, and of course, particularly, well, it, it's less so apparent in, in our world, we, we make sure that everything is secure. Uh, uh, and that's another way of controlling this unpredictable future. 
And hope is to me a word um, that said, I hope this is not going to happen, or I hope such and such is going to happen, is to control that. I'm not talk I am not judging this. This is not a moral, uh, the word hope in itself is not a moral value. What you hope to happen is a moral value, not the hope in itself. And I believe that hope, and then I get to faith, that hope uh, is something that the religion has used as a way to help people overcoming this uh, uncertain future. Like I said, <coughs> I know you have not talked about this, but I didn't know what you were, to, were going to talk about. So I thought, well, in my when I was born and raised as a Catholic, I was I was told, well, if you live nice and well and nicely, and you may go to heaven. So when I hope I go to heaven, you know, this whole thing of hope making life better after after you die, or particularly after you die, uh, because that's even more uncertain than. What's, ha what's happening after you die? Um, that that's a way for people for people to cope with reality. And for me to say that hope, uh, the so hope in the sense of the way you talked about it, is for me more like uh, a positive hope. So in in essence, you uh, you you said that hope is uh, helping one another to get together and maybe build a better future. And that's, of course, usually the, the uh, interpretation of hope rather than sorry, despair. Um, that people who are in despair are actually more, they, they can't cope with reality in a more positive way. So they have, they are in despair. Um, so I would really like to discuss with you what, the, what your definition of hope is. Uh, in many other things you've said, which I found very interesting, um, about your, your relational view on life, that's exactly a, the way I look at, at uh, science. Um, but I don't think that religion is necessary in this uh, picture. But I believe that we always um, uh, act, think, well, whatever you can, ever, any verb you choose uh, is a expression of a relationship. Nothing is like there is no real I uh, this, this detached from the environment. There's only an I and a you in relationship. But there's also only a chair in relationship with me. This chair is not well. Then I get philosophical. This chair is not an objective chair in the sense that. Uh, it is like this thing that if I'm not there, that the chair is like for ev everything, for everybody the same. For me, the chair is only the chair because I am a person in a relationship with that chair. And for a ant or for a fly, it's complete, it's a different object. So uh, it's because of our senses that we have a relationship with objects. And apparently, because we are human and we have the height, we look at this chair. Uh, in a similar way. So for chairs and objects it's not so difficult, but then we're looking at the way we view the future or we want to establish uh, what we call a better future, whatever that may mean, is a very normative uh, act because is it actually worse for us and for children in our days than it was in these days than in our days? I don't know, it depends on how you view it. Um, so all these things depend on the relationship, and so that's a, a very much agree with that. I don't know whether we disagree at all. <laughs> the only thing that is not necessary if I talk about your sense of hope, the way you talked about hope, is that uh, religion is a necessary element in it, but perhaps you don't think that either. Um, the other one, the one I think I'm going to say was... Oh yeah, that's uh, your uh, why I believe that religion, because uh, you you actually did a very nice uh, sociological analysis of why religious people are more healthy, more happy, more whatever. Um, this is true. In on average, everything is on average, because there are very many 
unhappy people that are very devout Catholics and very happy uh, agnosts who are very, uh, who are happy. So it's all on average, but in general, uh, uh, there are more happy religious people than there are uh, uh, non-religious people. Um, and I believe that ha that's another thing that I've tried to explain in my terms, and it has to do with the fact that we're all in a relationship, that, that relations are important, that gives us uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, a sense of, uh, of connectedness, as you said, and which has to do with attachment. And attachment is not just to your mother and your father or to whatever, but it's also to your environment and also to other people. And this attachment needs a way of being uh, uh, being molded. And a religion, being part of a group, helps to to extend or to magnify or to enlarge this. A feeling of attachment to a group or to people, uh, and we don't. I don't think that uh, our secular society has found a replacement for that, and that's why I believe that religion, or spirituality, will always be a major thing in our life because we need something to help us attach. Not many people can can actually live the life of a recluse or a somebody. No, outside of society. Very few people can do that. And, if, uh, and with religion, it used to be very, very clear. You go to the church or, well, that's what, uh, that's what I, how I see religion. You go to the church and you go to a meeting or whatever. And you always see these people. There's a structure. There's, you, you go always on Sunday or always on Saturday, or always on Friday. And it gives you sort of a structure in life that helps you to go through life. And without that structure, it's more difficult for a majority of people. So that's why I believe that religion will always be, or for a long time, will be a very major issue, uh, uh, aspect of life, because it will help people to get through this. And which is underlying the idea of the re that relationships are the essential aspect of our, of not our, just our lives, but also of science, of which we can talk later if we want. I think that's all I want to say. We have some big issues here. First, in hope and religion. Um, let me start by uh, uh, asking you uh, Anna's reaction on giving a small definition of hope. Um, she mentioned some aspects of it uh, as to her first response when thinking about it. In essence, it's nothing, it's a kind of a lazy, magical spell, if I may summarize, and um, religion only uses it because it's a nice way to help people. Um, and also, I heard you say it's unscientific, so uh, um, hope is something religion uses, whereas we, in science, we, we use well, different approaches and have a bit more certainty than hope. Um, no, I just no, no, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, is it more than just a religious way of helping people, and more than just a magical spell to deal with things we don't know in the future? Yes, when Anna was was talking, uh, and she she talked about the incantation, I put down magic. Um, I, I think there's a difference between religion and magic, and. Um, Certainly, hope is more than just some kind of weak term uh, that, that, that expresses, um, you know, some kind of vague intention or aspiration. Um, and actually, magic, you know, is is an attempt to control and manipulate the world. And I've been saying, actually, we can't do that. Um, and even within science, you know, uh, technocratic solutions to things that's a quick fix for everything. I think is part of that sense. Uh, which is why I opened really with Frank Furey's analysis of saying, um, you know, uh, the fear of risk is actually an attempt to to cloak and repress our, our vulnerability, which is part of nature. You know? mm -hmm. um, so, so hope is not some magical incantation. Uh, and what I was really saying, it's um, it's a composite really, um, and I think it comprises some of the things I was talking about. So. 
um, hope is, is about um, a capacity to foster certain kinds of qualities. So the qualities of resilience, so that you can survive advers adversity and deal with vulnerability. Um, it's that capacity of imagination which enables you to, to see through the present and see past, you know, and have creative problem solving to the present. But I think this, this issue of having uh, a sense of vision, whether that's religiously derived or, or you know, more generally utopian in a good sense, um, that's that ability to, to place yourself and the present within a wider narrative that perhaps is historical, that perhaps is transcultural, which tells you a story about resilience in the face of, of defeat, um, uh, human creativity in the face of, of fear, um, uh, human ingenuity in the face of vulnerability. You know, so so that's, it's, it's more a kind of cluster of qualities and an ability to call forth those, those kinds of things. For, <clears throat> to me, that's the result of the act of hoping. But that's a semantic problem here, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> to me, it's, it's like, if I, if I think about the word, I am hoping, mm -hmm. not, not hope, hope is the verb, is, is the noun, eh? I am hoping, then it's some kind of like mental act, whatever that may be. That mental act came from some bodily act. And it says, it's, you're, you're saying it's something that uh, helps you cope with eh? um, uncertainties. But, but not cope in a passive way. Uh, and I think I've been emphasizing that hope is a practice. You know, I take Stefan Scrimshard's idea. So, but, he, but maybe, maybe it will have, sorry if I'm, mm -hmm. uh, if I'm interrupting, but if we take a, a, a more, um, well, uh, an example uh, of hope, because uh, when we were uh, discussing this lecture uh, beforehand, uh, you were also saying, um, you haven't emphasized that much tonight, but that it was kind of lazy. Um, so, um, it's easy to say when, when we look at global warming, oh, mm -hmm. I, I just hope there will be scientists yeah. someday that mm -hmm. will invent something um, so that mm -hmm. we can stop global warming. And that's a way of not acting. It's, yeah. it's, it still allows mm -hmm. you to, to get in your airplane, to mm -hmm. drive your car. Um, so, what makes your hope different from just saying out loud, oh, I just hope mm -hmm. somebody is yeah. yeah. Well, because it's more than a form of words. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we only hope because we have memories and, and other examples of, of what it means to hope. And that's, that's the point, that, that what turns this from just, oh, you know, good wishes and nice sentiments is, is actually because it's always grounded in relationships and practices. And that's the difference between, you know, fear of often of the unknown and something that actually renders new possibilities concrete through relationships, through projects, through stories to tell which are about change in positive ways. So, but then maybe it is a semantic yeah, <laughs> so question, because problem, yeah, yeah. why then um, don't we call it uh, realism and being well informed uh, and a good citizen? <laughs> yeah, well, you can do. Um, but, but realism, you know, in its, in its mm -hmm. best sense, um, once again, um, it's precisely about facing up to the moral ambivalence of the world. You know, that, that we do good things for bad reasons and bad things for good reasons, you know, and, and, we're, and we're compromised. But you're saying hope from is that. an act. You yes. think hope is a very active yeah. word. To me, yeah, see, to me, it's hope is just not, in that sense, it's just a word. And a word that people use to, to say something about that they like to be, how they like the future to be. Mm -hmm. Usually, it looks yeah. <laughs> So that. So that's an interesting difference in how you view hope. For me, hope is then, does this, is this followed by some act in which I can see that you are helping this hope that you have to materialize? See, that's the next step for me. But for you, it's, yeah, it's a difference. It's actually already the act. Yeah, that's... I think that's what I was arguing. Yeah, yeah. That, for me, that's a different. Uh, yeah, yeah. I never expected that. <laughs> <laughs> so then, um, uh, the other issue you addressed was religion. Um, you said, uh, in your view, religion is not necessary in this space. 
I think I even heard you say that. You said it's um, uh, the values of well-being and morality are not limited exclusively only to mm. religion, and there's other movements as well. Um, however, you also said that religion has certainly has a, an added value um, because of its powerful link. Here we have it again between faith mm. and action. Um, and I was wondering, what here is the defining correct characteristics of religion? Mm -hmm. Because um, what sets it apart from a moral system defined by uh, Naomi Klein or Occupy, mm -hmm. which you mentioned? Mm -hmm. And um, what is it that a religious movement or a religious pack of moral mm -hmm. codes mm -hmm. has that is a, mm -hmm. an extra or an added value? Uh, yeah, an added value. Um, well, we, we just tried to define hope. Now we're going to try yeah. to define hope. Yeah. 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 Um, of course, there's no essence of religion. Um, but, uh, and, and certainly I'm, I'm not saying none of, the, none of the material, none of the evidence says that, that you know, religion uh, by itself, and certainly, yes, you know, religion damages a lot of, of people awesome. and keeps people in that, that sense of powerlessness. So pie in the sky when you die, you know, offering mm -hmm. uh, a kind of... Uh, a resignation um, that, that suffering is in some way the human lot. But I think at its best, religions and religious practices and traditions, they have a, a, a powerful narrative that you know is, is, is more than just one generation old. You know? So it has narratives of, of change and, and how uh, humans act in history and, and how um, they are possibly grasped by by powers beyond the human. So I think uh, self-transcendence, which is there in language, it's there in that sense of the child learning um, a web of relationships. It doesn't have to be you know, a god in the sky, but I think it's a sense of uh, something, uh, a being or a force or a power that, that is beyond me um, and which I can't control or invent. You know, so yes, that could be secular history that you know predates me and which has its own logic. But I think religion, you know, tells a very important story about um, a power of benevolence um, that is is bigger than just human consciousness that brings human well-being and human goodness into being, um, but is is not just simply contained by it. And again, I think in the face of something like global warming to be saying, you know, humans are not the only game in town. Human self-interest and the pursuit of human self-interest has actually got us in quite a lot of uh, a bad way. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, to think about ourselves in relation to uh, human others, but also non-human others, who might be non-human animals, they might be the earth, but they might also be, as it were, a, a divine being, then all of that just displaces that sense that uh, of, of a kind of supreme humanism that is simply self-interested and um, you know will only pursue its own its own um, its own ends. Now, of course, there's a there's a kind of religion that says, oh, we don't need to change anything, you know, because uh, God's willing climate change and that's the way God's going to bring the world to an end, you know. But uh, I mean, that's a fairly rubbish theology of creation, you know. It's well, pretty, yeah. <laughs> so you know, I think theologically you could have. Have a go at that. So yeah, again, you know, there's always going to be ways in which in which religion crushes people and damages people. But what keeps me coming back to the idea that um, you know it's an important element of human experience is I think this sense that it just displaces our egos, mm -hmm. you know, personal and kind of species level. I think. But I mean, I heard you ask the question, Anna. Um, you know, do we need religion to cultivate hope? And could we find an alternative, you know, um, that, that, would, that would facilitate the qualities of attachment and resilience and all these things, you know? Um, are, there, are there alternative ways of doing that which don't have the damaging and toxic effects of, of organised religion? Some people would say that, you know, a form of spirituality which also fosters connectedness, mm -hmm. Which is also about you know placing trust in a, a power bigger than myself, and that you don't need to call that organised religion and so on. I would say that there is something about the continuity of, of organised forms of religion and the corporate collective sense of that, which is uh, 
just yeah. a personal meditation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I agree with that. <clears throat> like I said, because it gives you, but well, that's more from a, I guess I would call that a psychological explanation. Um, but I don't believe that there, that secular, suppose we could find a secular way similar or similar to a religious uh, community, mm -hmm. that that would be better and not have the adver adverse effects, no way. There are always also <coughs> adverse effects, always. Groups may have their, may, may have their, their uh, ideals together and everybody's like, oh, if, this is, if we're gonna do it this way, it's gonna be hunky dory, you know. And, and everybody's joining in and before long, there are structures, there are rules, there are, and problems arise because people disagree with the rules and so, so you're saying that, that non-religious solutions same thing, same problem. So <laughs> actually, the problem isn't religion. No, it's not religion. No, no, not religion. No, no. Well, no. Maybe it's just that to me, it has no added value. But I see the added value in general of religion, like you said. I, I mean, I cannot deny that people who are who, in in, in many cases, have a have like a for their lives, it's very. Uh, uh, what's it called? Um, enriching, mm -hmm. uh, yes. And of course, that, and there's a minority that for which it, for whom it's not enriching, not at all. But that's the same thing in secular uh, mm -hmm. groups. I don't believe that there. I mean, we have seen uh, yeah, in the 70s uh, communes where people were, oh, this is going to be the best life ever. You know, and before long, it was big problems. You know, so no, I don't think. The only thing about about religion is that uh, people have some something else outside the group. It's something, but you know, maybe not the God in the sky, as you said, but something divine, something higher power, something whatever. And that fact is is connecting the people rather than something that they have to do themselves. But if I understood you correctly, you say it's it's more than just this value of relationships and having something that transcends the you as a human or, or the whole group even. It's also this set of moral values which helps you to cope with the fear and the not knowing and the... Uh, so there's, um, there's also the added value of, of a moral code or a moral system. Mm -hmm. um, and do you see that the same way or...? In most. Religion. Well, there's some religions and some not. You know. I mean, but also if you get your seven virgins or seventy virgins, I don't think that's <laughs> kind of <value. laughs> But uh, after you, uh, you well, I, I was wondering because of, because of the continuity of religion, if a new group like Occupy mm -hmm. um, is not in a way uh, more prone to have success. Because uh, religion always has to deal with this very yeah. bad reputation, mm -hmm. and uh, especially with secular people, this bad mm -hmm. reputation seems to linger on more than, than the good things that have happened. Um, so if Occupy says to people, please consume less, mm -hmm. we, we start to listen, what do we have to say, why do we have to do it, why does, when the church says it, we think, oh, there they go again, they're patron mm -hmm. patronizing us, and uh, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, wouldn't you say, from a success point of view, <laughs> that maybe the, the secular movements would have more, um, well, chance of succeeding? Um, yes, but again, I think it's sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, and, and you know, you, you almost again fall into the trap of saying, well, the leaders of one particular movement tell us to do that. Yeah, yeah. So we do it. Yeah. In fact, you know, it's it's much more about a, a community thing, and that's that's the way that. Organisations often just fall foul of their own of their own um, uh, shortcomings. Really, um, I mean, I guess this is. I only touched on it uh, tonight. Um, this whole post secular idea that we've we've got a situation now where it's not that um, our, our public discourse is to say, well, we don't want religion, and the sooner we can get rid of religion uh, as a source of well being or as a source of social cohesion, the better. The point is, religion, despite everybody's best efforts, is not going away. And we've, and we've got some elements that are very toxic and very damaging, and we've got some elements that are, uh, that are more conciliatory. Um, and, and yet we've still got this very strong 
resistance and suspicion of religion. So how do we create uh, you know, a place for, for public debate and coalitions of movements that can actually draw that together? Now I'm suggesting one, one solution to that, but of course the flaw in that is that the, the people who, um, as it were, are fundamentalist, you know, in that their truth is the only truth, mm -hmm. religious fundamentalism or others, they're, they're not likely to commit themselves to something where there is a, a plurality of views. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, some people would say, well, common purpose on something that is pragmatic actually enables people, as it were, to, to hold back on those deeper debates, but, but to bring the values that motivate them for that particular campaign into discussion. And in the best traditions of broad-based organising, you have a discussion in thinking through your strategies, you actually start to draw incrementally, bit by bit, on the values that inform you so that you gain a better appreciation and understanding of everyone else, mm -hmm. but in the context of something that is, that is facing you all as a common problem. Mm -hmm. So it's not that you're just forced with debating huge abstract metaphysical problems, mm -hmm. but the values uh, which are important and not bracketed come into play in relation to something that feels quite tangible feels quite concrete and immediate. Mm -hmm. So that's that's their way of dealing with it. But in a way, you know, that's a that's a form of idealism as much as anything. And mm -hmm. perhaps it just simply involves more hope. But you know <laughs> and I mean Habermas's model I think, you know, is is hopeful in, in the sense of benign and, and humanistic in a good sense, in that, you know, he actually believes that what makes us human is our capacity to communicate and that we're driven by that above mm -hmm. all else. Mm -hmm. And so as you were saying, it's that it's that capacity for connection that is actually that makes society possible. Yeah. And so his, his political settlement rests on that as above all else. Right, I, I, I agree and believe that religion is not going to go away. I don't want it to go away. I have no, I have no <laughs> wish to either fight or uh, whatever. Because um, I believe, like you said, that the plurality, perhaps that's what's interesting. But, and what it is, what makes it important no, let's put it this way. Um, I believe that people should have, should be able, that's their freedom, whatever that may mean, I have to define that first. <laughs> uh, but at least in a society, we have decided that you can choose to believe or not to believe, or and you can, even, and if you believe, you can also choose which, you know, whether you're Catholic or, or a Buddhist, or I, mean, I don't know whether they call themselves believers, but. A Hindu or a Muslim, or I think that's just fine. It's just that the only thing that we should respect is very simple: that you can you can choose to live the life according to the rules you have find uh, uh, appropriate for you. And then people say, uh, but you have to do it at home, and you have, don't have to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can't mix it with politics, and I think this is impossible. I think it's impossible to um, to not to leave to leave your religion at home, and then I'm not going to the politics, and when I'm home, I'm going to the religion. That's I mean that's incomprehensible to me. So I have nothing against uh, Christian Democrats, uh, political parties. If that's that's the way they they see society, it helps them to think about how to live life, how to organize life. The other thing I don't want is that people tell me to think that, think that way. But to motivate uh, your choices and the way you would like to organize society is equally uh, justifiable by a religion as by a non-religion. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and yeah, now we're drifting away from hope, but well, <laughs> that's a bit. <laughs> Um, uh, but, but I do have a question related to this because um, um, I heard you say, and, uh, well, I think I heard you say that this this debate uh, for a better future uh, and um, um, a way to deal with the uncertainties we're facing um, is now well, it, it isn't properly held this debate. But one could argue that this debate is held in politics. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I think. When we would discuss this with our prime minister, he would say we have this debate all the time about what are our values, um, and that's um, what we as politicians uh, 
do in our everyday life. And um, you said that the neoliberal capitalist system has a, a void we have to fill with uh, a new system of belief and, and morals. Um, but what if this capitalist system is already filled with that and it's just one human possibility among others, as you said, mm -hmm. and it just, just happens to be the one we all, I think, don't agree with. Can you repeat the question? Well, I'm, I'm wondering because, um, well, if, let me state it in a different way. I'm wondering if the, the problem is not that this neoliberal capitalist system has a void, Mm. But the problem is that it's filled with a moral code okay. we don't agree with. Yeah. And what do we do then? Because mm -hmm. we already have, maybe we already have this place mm -hmm. where we have a moral debate, but it's just not our kind of show. <laughs> well, I, I would argue that we, we are, it's unclear what these moral values are. We are not very specific about it. But a moral yeah. value could be uh, we want to have more riches, we want to have a car, we want to have a, a house, we want to have some. Economic stability. It's not a moral code I agree with, but it's, it could be one of these, uh, well, one of the human possibilities. So I think my experience of politics in Britain is that there, there is no discussion of moral values. Exactly. And there's no, you know, we, we don't actually go back to first principles of no. saying what kind of society do we want. No. Um, it's about, well, we've got to do this, and, yeah. um, you know, we've got to manage the debt, and we've got to cut welfare. Yeah. And, um, this kind of thing. Um, but I think you are right that um, we think of the market economy as, as neutral and not having values, but it does, and that's about consumption and obsolescence and, uh, and, and competition and so mm -hmm. on. But those aren't laid bare mm -hmm. either. Um, but actually, I would say to anybody who wanted to engage in that debate, well, um, what what deeper values about what makes us human, what it means to be uh, a person, what kind of good society do you want? Um, you know, if you don't want a society based on consumption and competition and, uh, you know, ex exclusion of minorities, immigrants and so on, then why mm -hmm. do you want that? Mm -hmm. like, what view of human nature have you got and where do you get it from? Yeah, okay. Uh let me just, we, we will just uh, continue our discussion, but um, if you want to ask a question, please just raise your hand and uh, maybe there are already some questions now. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm a little bit troubled by the term post-secular. I, I wonder what it meant and, and why, it, um, why someone made it up in the first place. <laughs> what is the term post-secular? Yeah, well, mean? what's that? Oh, and what kind of use do we have by mm -hmm. having this term? Okay. Um, I didn't make it up. <laughs> uh, it's, it's there. Uh, um, Jürgen Habermas talks about it. Um, Charles Taylor, lots of other philosophers. Um, and, uh, well, again, problems of definition. We can spend a bit more time about that. Um, broadly, it's saying that the, the narrative in, in Western countries that as we get more uh, industrialized, more advanced, more sophisticated, then religion will die or go to the margins. That we get more rational, we get less religious. Um, which has really been the characteristic of most sociological theory since the 19th century, since sociology started. Uh, that modernity sends religion to, to the edges. Um, and that we don't need to think about the role that religious values play in public life because, as Anna was saying, that's what we do in the privacy of our own homes. And it's not going to have a, a bearing on society anymore because we're all going to be scientific. Um, but probably since the Iranian revolution of 1979, which saw the first creation of a kind of politicized Islam, um, the emergence of the moral majority in the 1980s in the United States, where you get actually the, the 1920s fundamentalists who did retreat, almost went to the hills. Uh, you know, they come back into politics and they start influencing presidents and paying lots of money, particularly to the Republican Party. Um, clearly 9-11, where you have um, ostensibly religiously motivated actions changing the shape of global politics, um, through to kind of local examples of faith-based civil society. 
religion is there. Some people say it never went away, but it's got a new visibility. So religion returns. But as I said, this is not de-secularization, and it's not religious revival. And no one, I think, in any uh, organized Christian denomination, certainly in our bit of Western Europe, can afford to be the least bit optimistic, because the, the church is, is declining still numerically. But what you've got is the, the, the form of, of religious pluralism, particularly because of immigration from the global south into European societies. You've got people turning away from organized religion, but still uh, appreciating forms of spirituality, whether those are Eastern derived or much more kind of personal, even through to kind of putting flowers by the roadside if there's been an accident or something like that, um, using popular music at funerals and that kind of thing. So you've got this huge sort of diversification of religious into non-religious sensibility. But basically what you're stuck with is religion hasn't gone away, and yet you've still got the strong narrative of secularization and secularism of people who say, we don't want any of this superstitious stuff tainting our political debate. So it feels like you're being squeezed, and it's unprecedented, because most liberal political thought from John Rawls says, we bracket out our beliefs. Those are our personal things, and we leave them at home. And we come in as citizens, and we're all disinterested, and we're all the same. Well, actually, we're not the same. So we've got to rethink another way of um, drawing in religious values, non-religious values. Some people call the secular sacred, you know, these, these kinds of deeply felt forms of sentiment in the best way, you know, that, uh, that show still a need for public ritual, for people responding to, to tragic events or to civic events um, by using you know, flowers, candles, popular music and so on. Um, so it's about all of that happening all at once and trying to figure out you know, how, you, how you sort of organize your political life accordingly. Post-secular, the secular is still there, but we're slightly more skeptical about it winning out than we were once before. But pro I mean, for me, a very problematic, very kind of agonized place, I think, a very paradoxical place. More questions? Or? Yeah. Yes, I, I do have a question in terms of uh, the linking of religion uh, towards the, the topic of the evening of hope. I hear you definitely say you see an added value of religion uh, towards the topic of hope. I hear you a bit of more indifferent uh, opinion there. Can, can I maybe be a bit more provocative, like even saying it's, it's detrimental religion mm -hmm. to the power of hope, if I then take the example of the, the Muslims, and I don't mean the Muslims as such, but the fanatic Muslims, most, uh, let's say, powerfully uh, embodied through the Islamic State, through IS, mm -hmm. that for me is even detrimental to the power of hope. Mm -hmm. So, hence, is religion not the, mm -hmm. the opposite mm -hmm. effect? Well, this is just one example, but, you know, uh, I can't, um, there must be, like, secular things that went completely berserk, um, and uh, I can't find uh, my example, of course, now, but uh, this is just happening, this is just IS. Uh, but also uh, um, Orthodox Jews, or the Catholics, uh, 100, 200 years ago were, you know, like still decapitated people who were uh, of a different faith. So it's not just the Muslims, and um, I, yeah, it's, it's a problem that I can't think of an example of. Uh, Somebody else has an example of a group who who did who doesn't uh, use faith as a reason for committing atrocities. Communism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hitler. Yeah. 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 It's very easy yeah. to say, oh, there's good religion and bad religion, and I, I don't want to say that. Yeah. I think we've got to pursue it further, yeah. it's an important point. Yeah. I think what I was trying to do was, was slightly take religion apart 
and see what, what it was about a faith tradition that actually inspired you know, these, these positive things. So um, some kind of narrative or um, you know, doctrines that, of, that anticipate uh, something greater to come in which you can pin your hopes, but not in a kind of unrealistic way. This idea of connectedness and attachment um, this idea of self-transcendence, in other words, that you don't simply act in the world uh, as if it were a projection of your own ego and, and just simply a canvas for your, own, for your own interests. And I suppose we can all say, oh yes, but you know, these particular religious traditions don't fulfil those things. Um, you know, they, they are about reinforcing particular sectional interests, they're dividing humanity, they're exclusive and so on. Uh, I mean, it's still it still troubles me that that doesn't feel good enough because it's still us judging them. Um, but, and I also think that in a way, those kinds of movements are themselves responses of fear. You know, they are the responding defensively and, um, you know, who can say how much of Islamic State is actually a particular response to actions of the West in the Middle East and Afghanistan and South Asia over many generations. Um, but that takes me back to the point I made that, um, you know, you, you can't respond to fear and insecurity with, with more barricades. You know, you, you've actually got to seek the rapprochement. You, you've actually got to think about how your actions foster a greater human community. And I guess that's the, you know, that's the only criterion I come to again. Um, does it enable us to connect with others? Does it con enable us to connect with uh, reality beyond the human in a way that's life affirming and not sort of death dealing but um, you know that's a complicated issue and I still feel like I'm pronouncing a kind of western liberal um, <coughs> middle of the road way on the very troubling fact that a lot of forms of religion appear to us frightening and toxic and divisive. Well one could argue that a movement like IS is a result of the fact that we haven't had this debate about how we want uh, to have our society, what kind of shared values and beliefs we have. It's, it's a, it might be a direct response to that, not only to, do, to Western oppression, mm -hmm. but also mm -hmm. to the fact that we haven't, they, they feel like they haven't had a say. And, and there's a strand of radical Islam, I think, um, that looks to the West and says, we don't want yeah. that world of consumerism and, and addiction and family breakdown and so on. So the response then is to reinforce what we see as traditional values and, and um, turn to particular forms of certainty, whether those are you know, doc doctrinal or communal or whatever. And, and that's another response to the secular, that, that you simply reinforce um, the very strong boundaries of your, your own religious tradition and your own religious community. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, um, I was just wondering, uh, I've got a feeling there's a, there's a correlation between um, decreasing religious or, or um, uh, people practicing religion in Western Europe and uh, a higher pressure on individuality and making your own future and being in control of your own future. Mm -hmm. I think that those two go in hand in hand. But I was just wondering, um, does that sort of put too much pressure on the individual, sort of to share the load that was formerly, you know, uh, borne by, oh, why did you say that in English? Uh, how, to share the load that religion used to carry, because it's sort of the communal sense of we're going to get through bad times, we're going to mm. uh, work towards this goal, or we're going to uh, reach heaven, we're going to reach another state of being in another life, which is the rule. Mm. But how do you reward yourself when there's no system um, behind you? And like it's, um, I'm just wondering, how does individualism fit in with uh, like secularization? I think you're right. I think there is a link, um, and it's back to the post-secular thing that we can't um, um, disinvent um, modernity. Yeah. We can't think ourselves back to another place, and most of us wouldn't want to. Um, because you know that other place was probably places where women 
you know, we're not able to hold academic posts, least of all in theology. Um, and, and we have an idea of ourselves as individuals with choices and so on. Um, that's very much a result of, of a, a kind of secular enlightenment. Although, of course, the enlightenment was always a religious thing as well. And, uh, you know, I think from religious tradition, you get a very strong sense of the dignity, the irreducibility of the individual. And Habermas has certainly written on that. Um, I think what I was trying to say in my, in my um, lecture was that it's, it's a dynamic, it's an interplay between um, being formed as, as an individual, but not in an atomized, individualistic way, but an individual who is able to grow to the fullest of their capacities, which is another way of thinking about virtue ethics, um, but within a framework of a family, of a community, um, of, of a neighborhood that um, affirms them, that shows them the way, that, that gives them appropriate boundaries, doesn't invade those boundaries. So the sexualization of children, I think, is, is part of that. So once again, it's an interplay between um, being valued, and, and it's like, you know, do, do we love first, or do we learn to love through being loved? And I think it's very much that interplay. So the individual, yes, because um, we're, we're all valuable people, but not in that atomistic way. And again, religion can give very crushing uh, accounts of, of our lack of freedom, but at its best, it can help us uh, see new ways of you know, service to others and compassion and all the good things that actually enable us to, to flourish. Also, I was wondering, um, I think religion offers hope in a way of reassurance, as in people have to deal with less um, metaphysical questions themselves. Like, if it's all thought out, it's like you're in completely uh, fixed systems. Like, oh, you're going to go to heaven, or you're going to do anything. I think um, if you lose religion in that way, religion uh, decreases, then I just wondered, uh, that's what, that's what you also talked about with the pluralism. People have to come up with their own mindsets and their own uh, ways of uh, fitting in their lives. And I think that is um, not really sure where I'm going with this. Give me a second. <laughs> um, I think it's interesting that people have to think about these things now. They're forced to look at their future and they're forced to look at what they believe in. Um, in a way that can be very frightening. I think that just adds to fear of the future and everything because. There's so much that you need to fill in, and you have no idea. There's no one speaking it to you from, uh, like, preaching it to you or whatever. And I think sort of, I know individualism might not be one of the best ways to, to go about this. And I just wonder. I, I suppose I'm just I'm just curious about the, um, the, the, the the future of of how how this is going to go on, like. We talk about post secular, but what, what is it going to be next? Like post secular, post post secular, mm -hmm. like, I don't yeah. know. So, where are we going to go to? And yeah, we like, still have metaphysical. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So now, yeah, but still, there's still these, these remnants of like these Christian values in Western Europe, you know, um, uh, carrying the load for others and helping others and, you know, uh, paying taxes for, uh, for a greater good so that people can do stuff with that, like the government can use that money. Maybe the question is, could we, we survive without religion? Yeah, um, at least well, yes, we can, because I'm not. But <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but I mean, we as, as, as humanity. No, as, but, but, as but what I think, what is, what is the problem with, with the way you pose it is like, as if it is the answer for, to everybody, I believe there are people who feel oppressed by being in a religion, having to believe or act the way that's prescribed. There's also people. Who, who flourish in that kind of circumstances. The same for, the, for people who flourish when they are, can decide for themselves. And also people who die when they have to decide for themselves. It's such a personal thing. You can't, can't say whether this is good or bad in, as a general thing. It's very I think personal. Yes, yeah, well, yeah. well, if you can pass it as a like, short question. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, I think if, Post secularism is still sort of um, going on, going on, and you know, uh, sort of increasing, and like uh, religion is getting less and less in countries like this. And I'm just wondering, um, there's so many like unthinkable, innumerable 
uh, opposing views in every kind of small detail because there's no system anymore. It might be a political system, a polit political belief, even though in the like, Netherlands you see there's so many different ways that you can think. And I think, I'm just curious about how this is going to go on, but nobody knows. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not so sure whether it's, there are so many different beliefs. Like most people think that you should not steal. Most people think that you should not kill. Most people believe that you should not, well, fill in. Most people believe that way. So I think in that respect, so much uh, agreement among people. Otherwise we would have already been hit, hitting each other on the head here. So it's just the way we express it, the way we ritualize it. And the, rit the ritualization has kind of disappeared for many people. Or individualized. We well, will also a common story. Narrative. Do yeah. we need a common story or but a common narrative? The secular misses a kind of common narrative. Yes, I think so. But yeah. focus on yeah. that. Again, this common common narrative could could be capitalism as well. Because um, I don't know the, the energy you, you create um, of the society in fear and um, uh, experiencing an emptiness or a void is, I think, when we just walk in the streets right now in Nijmegen and we go ask people, it's not something a lot of people would recognize. They, they are doing their Christmas shopping, or their Santa Claus shopping, but, uh, and um, they're not really bothered by um, a terrorist attack or uh, an economic crisis. Well, some, the economic crisis hits some of them hard, but most of them don't care. And um, I think even, maybe if you ask people directly, they don't even care what kind of, uh, state they live in as long as they have their own freedom and their own car and their own so isn't isn't the problem we're creating here a typical academical one <laughs> um I, I think this is part of the post-secular dynamic mm -hmm. that um yes a, a lot of people don't have a faith and they've not even grown up with something it's not even as if they were raised in something that they've made a conscious effort to discard um, I think in places like the UK and the Netherlands, we're, we're so secular now as, as, as cultures that, um, uh, you know, it's not like there's much even of a religious memory enduring. Um, but the post-secular is that people sort of half know that, but they don't quite know where to go with it, because it's not a question of, you know, restoring some kind of all-encompassing religion that's actually going to answer your questions, because we don't live like that anyway. That happens maybe for minority, but that's not what the question is. I think for most of us, even maybe those of us and you that, that have, you know, a, a kind of quite, you know, you're, you're sort of quite regular religious observers, we're all living off fragments, really, I think. And it's, it's how we can best do that. But I wonder really where we do discuss these values. Are they discussed in schools? Are they discussed in universities? They're not discussed on the television, you know. Yeah. And often it's only when, you know, maybe there's a terrible national disaster yeah. or an individual experiences a crisis like a bereavement. Um, you know, people turn to religion when they're in hospital and things like that because, yeah. you know, they've lived on the fragments and suddenly, you know, something happens and they fall through the gaps in the fragments. Right. Yeah. But I think that has to do with like yeah. our society has I wonder what this is a verb. Scientific guys. <laughs> we are we we use science, science as a religion. That's what I believe. Mm. As a way, like that's the, that's the real way we should look at the world. I'm a scientist to say that's BS. <laughs> I really don't think that's the proper way. It's one way of looking at the mm -hmm. at the world at the at, at phenomena, and in some ways it helps us developing things. But it's not like a replacement of anything. Not, not, and it's actually damaging uh, our our um, our common conversation on how sh how should we uh, not so much live our lives, but how should we develop and, and organize a life so such that say like most people are having a proper life, whatever that may mean. Uh, because what science says is we are objective. 
uh, we don't have values, we don't have moral values. And I say, every decision you make in science is also a decision on a moral statement, it's normative. Every decision you make. And that's what we try to escape. That's the objective thing that I, that, that's a, 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 a mm, we try to tell people that we, uh, we can live without these moral values because ah, that's, more, that's moral. So, well, everything is moral. <clears throat> but uh, to say that science is replacing this is like the biggest uh, lie we, uh, we've put in the minds of people who don't know about science. Uh, I see you have a question. But let me just first ask you this debate on, on how we should want our society and on, on our values. Do you have any idea where you should uh, have this debate? As many places as possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but for example, um, within your church community is probably not a good idea because you, you have to have these. Well, of course, it's a good idea to have that. <coughs> you also have to uh, go behind it beyond this particular set of values and uh, look at the, um, the multicultural mm -hmm. view, the, the, the non-religious mm -hmm. view, the, the Jewish view, that, well, I, I, I don't know, even know where to start. So, um, uh, and of course, I, I was thinking one place where some of these moral questions are, are asked is on television. There are some, uh, uh, well, in, in Holland at least, we have some programs where people discuss, uh, 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 I don't know, what, what have we discussed lately? I uh, don't watch TV. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've, we've, we've had a big discussion on how, how you should punish somebody who is uh, a, a guy in, in Holland who um, uh, killed two people and a child, and uh, the judge couldn't sufficiently prove that uh, he was guilty of doing it. And um, there, there was a big moral debate in the Holland whether the results of the crash should, um, uh, in some way, influence the well, um, the the, jury, well, the the outcome of the process. Uh, so there are some cases where the, they are discussed, but of course it should be in 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 a place as public as possible. And maybe you already have some thoughts about. I have one little piece of experience. Some time ago, I was part of a working party for one of the churches in. England um, about urban life and faith cities, and um, we came up with a with a question: uh, What makes a good city? Um, and I've been thinking ever since that actually you could you could rework that question: What makes a good village? What makes a good school? Even what makes a good prison? Mm -hmm. uh, what makes a good university? Um, and it, it's a, it's quite a um, an innocuous question, a very, you know, it seems very bland, really, but you, you know, you could draw people together and, and they could put forward their views. As I say, you know, what makes a school? You could ask young children, well, you know, a school is where I like doing this, and they might say, well, a school is where I don't do any homework, but, you know, you might have to temper that in some way, but, oh, you, do it you know, it's, um, again, it's, it's like you, you create a space that's got a kind of focus, so it's got a common purpose. So you're not saying to people, now tell us your views on crime and punishment, um, you know, or your views on, you know, the, the electoral system. It's very, very precise. And you, you draw people together. I suppose it's kind of Habermas again, but it was a, you know, it was an example. What makes a good city, what makes a good neighborhood, etc. And that's a way maybe that, you know, they can paint pictures if they don't want to say words, they can you know, they can have other ways of addressing it. So it's another way in which quite pragmatically you you actually help people work through some of the things that really matter to them. But what makes a good city, what makes a good community? It's about my life on a day-to-day -day basis. What's going to make that better? How I work with other people, how I live with other people. So I think it has potential really to generate both very everyday things, but also quite visionary things too. We have one last question. Um, I was wondering um, how you would defend the virtue of hope uh, against uh, those who say that um, 
the idea of ha having a utopia, a small one for only one village or a big one for the whole world, uh, is actually the main problem. You uh, earlier in the discussion you uh, you talked of Hitler being a secular uh, man, but I don't think everybody would agree with you there. And um, one thing is for certain, he had a big uh, utopia with lots of hope and, and living things in his in his story, and that's what made all these people do horrible things. So, how would you um, defend, yeah, the, the goodness of hope when you see that everywhere there is this big violence or this this big misery? Always there is kind of hope behind it. Some people would say that. So, so your point is that every utopia has this this evil side in it as well? Well, or? some people would say that certainty and hope always go together and that they always um, make it possible for things to get aggressive, to get out of hand, whereas uh, uncertainty, um, as uncomfortable as it may be if you are not used to it, um, never really has this you know, active side and thus never have, has a uh, danger to it. I know some would say this. Richard Rorty was mentioned earlier and he is a big fan of hope, but in a very different sense, I think, and a big fan of cert uncertainty in self certainty. But hope and certainty, I don't understand how that goes together. Well, so, well, in my definition, of course not, because hope for me is something that... It's something yeah. irrelevant at all. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but <laughs> in the definition of hope we had was, it was like you have a, you have a utopia um, which uh, enables you to see through worries and say to yourself, things um, are uh, can be better if, if we just work together. That's that's what I understood of hope thus far. And so I'm posting this question because Hitler came up and all these things came up. So I thought, how could you really defend the virtue of hope in these, with these charges? Well, like Anna, I don't think hope and certainty go together. Yeah. And, and utopia is, um, is about displacing the certainty of the present or the fixity of the present. Mm -hmm in favour of other speculative alternatives. So, you know, science fiction is a very good example. It says, what if, you know, um, we haven't invented this, or women and men lived in, in different kinds of ways to one another, or... Uh, so it's just suspending the given, the certainty of the given, and allowing our imaginations to sort of play around with, with other things. Um, but it also then means that you realise how nothing, you know, nothing. There's no blueprint for anything. So I mean, I guess National Socialism and Hitler, you know, he said this is the way things are, and Germany is the way it is because, and if we do this, then you know we'll all be strong and everything like that. So actually, his utopia was full of certainty and full of dogmatism, uh, rather than saying what if we thought of ourselves differently. So I think utopia is that, is that much more, not uncertainty in a vague way, but uncertainty in a way that says, let's just, let's just see if there's an, a different way of resolving this problem and, and a different way of looking at ourselves. I have to round up my face. <laughs> well, thanks. Okay, I'll do it with that. Yeah. Um, I think this evening has proven to be a perfect example of how um, Oppositional views turn out not to be so oppositional once discussed, <laughs> so that might give us a lot of hope. Uh, so thank you very much, Elaine Gray and Anna Bosman, of course, Mate Chonahi, for being here and talking to us and sharing your views with us. Thank you for being here, for asking questions, for being involved in the discussion. Um, don't go home, I know there's a lot more to discuss, so we'll have drinks in the hall. If you'd like to discuss about the topic of fear a bit more, we organize a Denk studio on December the 11th. So you're very welcome. Thank you for being there and have a nice evening.